Today on Comic Misconceptions, Batman learns the true meaning of Christmas. Welcome to Comic Misconceptions, a show that takes you into detail about the things you think you know about comics. I'm your host, Scott Nicewander, and today we're going to be talking about Batman because people, Batman is one of my favorites, he's awesome, he's one of the greats, and all of you who think he's lame and overrated, you can leave because there's been so many different variations of Batman that at least one of them has to appeal to you, and today we're doing some Christmas Batman. But first, last week's trivia challenge, which was... In the Silent Night of Batman, what does Commissioner Gordon invite Batman to do? Trevor Dazraff got the correct answer by saying that Commissioner Gordon invited Batman to go sing some Christmas carols with the rest of Gotham's finest. But seriously, you guys? The rest of the answers you put down below on last week's episode were hilarious. If you want a good laugh, go check them out. They're great. You guys are amazing. So the story goes that it's Christmas Eve and Batman's out patrolling the streets because crime and disaster are not inclined to observe holidays. He sees the bat signal light up and heads over to see what's up. Commissioner Gordon then says, no, it's okay, there's actually no crime. I just wanted to invite you in to... Spend Christmas Eve with the rest of us here, singing some Christmas carols. Take the night off, you deserve it. Batman reluctantly agrees and starts singing some classic holiday jingles. And what happens next is a montage of three different stories that show that the spirit of Batman, which is an actual thing they say in the comic, is enough to instill joy and peace into Gotham City without Batman actually needing to physically be there. The first story we have is a boy who steals a gift from a lady who just got done shopping. And he goes to the alley where all of his friends are and they unwrap it together to find that it's a Batman action figure, not doll, mom. Suddenly they're just overcome with guilt and they wrap the gift back up and return it to the lady they stole it from. Then, more singing. Next up we see a man walking down the street with a gun. His hands are shaking. Whatever he's about to do, he's not happy about it. He bumps into a figure who appears to be Batman. But, as the guy raises his firearm, the figure turns around and is revealed to be a blind man dressed in a Batman costume trying to raise awareness for the Wayne Foundation Christmas Drive for the Blind. I don't know why this guy's dressed as Batman, or even if he knows that he's dressed as Batman. I mean, he's blind, right? He could have asked somebody, hey, go get me a Santa Claus costume, and then they got him a Batman costume instead, and he'd have no idea. It's just a fun little prank. I mean, I honestly think that this guy wanted to be Santa. Look at his Santa beard. It's too perfect not to dress up as Santa this time of year. I don't know. I guess it was just a harmless plank, but either way, it pays off. The guy with the gun felt so bad about what he was going to do that he throws his gun away. Then, more singing. Lastly, we have a story of a girl named Patty who is reading a letter, presumably, about how her husband Ted has died in combat. So, she goes to a bridge, just kind of reflects on what life is now without him, and then suddenly, he shows up, they make out, and then more singing. Batman realizes that he's literally been singing all night as it's now 6 a.m. Christmas day. And then things get a little odd. Commissioner Gordon just fades into nothingness, uttering something about the Christmas spirit or whatever. Then Batman freaks out, and when he comes to, he's right where we thought he would be with Commissioner Gordon and the other officers at the GCPD. My best guess to what happened is that Batman went in to sing some Christmas carols, then fell asleep, because you know, Batmaning is hard work. And then he dreamed about still singing or something? I don't know. But does that also mean that the stories weren't true? Were those just dreams that Batman had? Actually, if we apply some overanalyzing that I learned in my English classes in high school, I think yes. I think this isn't just a harmless Christmas story. These stories point to very important aspects of Batman, defining moments and deep characterness. Is that a word? I don't know. Let's, let's overanalyze stuff now. Take the first story, for instance. A crime happening in an alley where a young boy gets the inspiration to do good with his life. That's what the Batman action figure represents. It's the defining moment where Bruce Wayne's life 
went on a path to become Batman. The kid stole the gift not knowing what was inside, similar to how Bruce had no idea what was going to happen in the alley that night, but they both had the same outcome. Batman. So the kids try and rewrap the gift similar to how Bruce wishes that he could undo the damage that was done to his childhood. And if we look here, the gift is not returned in perfect condition. This represents how no matter how much good Batman does in the world, it will never make up for the loss of his parents. Boom! Overanalyzed. What's next? The guy with the gun? Come on, that's an easy one. Batman hates guns. His parents were killed by guns. This guy with the shaky hands represents the cowardice that goes into using firearms to do your dirty work. Now the guy almost shoots and kills the blind Batman stand-in who's holding a sign asking people to support the Wayne Foundation Christmas Drive for the blind. The blind. As a bat. But this sign also represents all of the good that the Waynes were doing in Gotham before they were killed. So the guy who almost shoots this guy sees that there's this Batman-like character that he's dressed up as, and this is kind of symbolic of how Bruce wishes there was someone like Batman when he was a kid that would have stopped his parents from being killed. This would-be shooter rethinks his actions and throws his gun away to keep Gotham City clean of crime and villainy. Nailed it. Last one. The girl reading that her husband is dead obviously represents Bruce trying to grasp the concept that his parents are dead. I mean, she's reflecting on this empty house where she used to spend time with her husband. Bruce still lives in his parents' old house that he grew up in, that he has all of these memories in. It must be really hard to still relive in a place where the people you love aren't coming back. The house that used to be filled with such love and joy is now empty, like a cave. A bat cave. Yeah. Yeah, that was a stretch. The lady goes to the bridge, still reading the letter. She's already read it. She knows what it says, but she's trying to reread it, thinking maybe she missed something. Maybe her husband isn't dead. Maybe uh, it was some sort of typo. She's in denial. Then she literally reflects on her circumstance, looking at the water, thinking, what's next for my life? And may I point out, that the reflection of the bridge in the water looks kinda like a bat. Bruce must have reflected on what was next in his life after his parents died. Uh, he still wishes that no matter what he's been told, by some fluke, his parents would still be alive, much like this lady's husband is. In the end, we see the lady tearing up the letter. This is symbolic of how Bruce wishes to rewrite history and have his parents still be alive with him. I just overanalyzed the poop out of those eight pages and immediately lost all credibility when I said the word poop. What do you guys think? Is this just a harmless Batman Christmas tale or is it a deeper look into the mind of Bruce Wayne? Let me know in the comments. I'm also about to say something that might make you guys a little upset. There will not be a trivia challenge today because there will not be another episode until January 13th. I know it sucks. I hate it more than you do. We're trying to get 2014 all set up for when that comes around, you know? We're trying to get a new lineup of shows, we're trying to get uh, Renegade up and going, lots of stuff we got coming for you. We're trying to make 2014 the greatest that NerdSync has ever given, and uh, that takes a lot of time. So we're gonna take a couple weeks off, and we'll be back in the middle of January with all new stuff. So, sorry for any inconvenience. And a little bit more bad news, because I'm going back to school in January, I can't do comic misconceptions every week. They have to be every other week now, because if I try to do a show every single week, then either my grades will suffer or the show will. And I don't want either to happen, so I'm just gonna try to space it out so I can still deliver the same quality that I want to give to you guys and also do good in college. And lastly, thank you so much for watching Comic Misconceptions in 2013. You guys have made it so awesome. We've only done a little over 20 episodes, but already it feels like I've been doing it forever. My hair has gone in all sorts of crazy directions. I've also gained a couple pounds, but you guys have stayed with me. And I'd say thank you for that. So with all that out of the way, I will see you right here next year for more things you thought you knew about comics. See ya. 
So at this point, Mugger 2's like, put your hands up. And Edda's being all smart alecky, like, I can't, my hand's on my face. And then she puts her hand on that guy's face, and that's apparently his weakness or something. And also, I want to point out that only one of these robbers is wearing a mask. The other one, I guess, just didn't get the memo. 